So uh, Rebecca Rugg Sykes has been fascinated by the vanished worlds of the Pleistocene Ice Ages since childhood and has followed this interest through a career researching the most enigmatic characters of all, the Neanderthals. After a PhD on the last Neanderthals within Britain, she worked in France at the world famous Pacea Laboratory Pacea. <laughs> Pacea, uh, at the Université de Bordeaux on topics ranging from Neanderthal landscapes and territories in the Mastiffs and Kraus region of the southeast France examining how they were the first ancient humans to produce a synthetic material and tools made of multiple parts. Rebecca is an honorary fellow at the School of Archaeology, Classics and Egyptology at the University of Liverpool, and she regularly writes for the popular media, media including Scientific American and Guardian Science blogs, and she is a co-founder of the Influential Trailblazers Project, which highlights women archaeologists, paleontologists and geologists through innovative outreach and collaboration. Okay. Then Jamie uh, has been fascinated by Ice Age environments and landscape change since his school days. His PhD in Cambridge explored environmental change and human activity in the mountains of Greece at the close of the last glacial. He's especially interested in rivers from the Mediterranean to Manchester, how they change over time and how we inter interact with them. Much of his career has been involved in collaboration with archaeologists, including a decade of field seasons in the River Nile in Sudan with the British Museum, and he's a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and the British Society of Geomorphology. Uh, Jamie's also a professor of physical at the University of Manchester, where he teaches courses on a Ice Age environments and global environmental change. And he's the author of the Ice Age, a very short introduction, uh, which has been translated into Swedish and Arabic, and there's also a Chinese uh, translation on the way. Mm. So you can find Jamie's book, which is this one, and also Rebecca. Uh, has a book uh, called Kindred, Neanderthal Life, Love, Death and Art. You can buy those from our online shop. And Rebecca, I believe, is putting the links into the chat box. And then just finally, just to say that while this event is free, Creswell Heritage Trust is a small independent charity. So we'd be super, super grateful if you could, uh, if you had any money to, sp to spend, you could donate just a few pennies to us. Um, my colleague is putting a crowdfunding link I believe into the chat box and you can make a donation or buy some uh, masks or postcards I believe. Okay so um, to begin then I think I'll ask you uh, Rebecca um, can you tell us about when the Neanderthals lived in Britain? Yeah um, and <clears throat> so in in terms of Cresswell's place uh, in the great Neanderthal story for Britain. It's actually quite late. Um, we know that uh, if I give people a bit of a background on Neanderthals as well to start with, so um, Neanderthals are pretty much our closest um, hominin relation. So that's um, on the on sort of within the Homo lineage. There's there's many different species um, going back before uh, two million years, um, but Neanderthals first appear. Um, both in fossil terms and genetic terms, um, somewhere between sort of six to 400,000 years ago. We can see genetically the common ancestor is around 600 and they begin to become sort of uh, distinctive as a population at least uh, by sort of 400 and certainly by about 350,000 years ago. So in Britain, we have evidence of hominins um, being present and doing lots of things um, far, far older than that, probably older than 900,000 years ago now, so nearly a million. Um, that's not Neanderthals. Um, the earliest uh, Neanderthal evidence we have um, is pretty early in their own history. It's around sort of 350. Um, this largely is lithic, so that's the artifacts that they made, the stone artifacts. Um, we do have at Swanscombe um, a uh, some some fossil stuff that could be early, sort of maybe proto Neanderthals, um, but we don't have any fossil remains really that we would say are like certainly Neanderthals till rather later, so around two hundred and seventy thousand years ago, and that's from Pont Naweth in uh, Wales, which is where I am. Um, that's from a cave there. There's there's multiple individuals there, represented by very fragmentary parts, teeth, um, with a large uh, assemblage of artifacts as well, um, made of sort of the local stones around there, some volcanic uh, rocks and things like this, with some uh, flint as well. But at Cresswell, 
we don't have any evidence of Neanderthals being present in terms of the archaeology they've left until far after that, um, around probably no earlier than about 55,000 years ago at Cresswell. Um, so that's a huge gap between the earliest Neanderthals in Britain and Cresswell, but that's actually representing a, a sort of a strange gap in the archaeological record as a whole for Britain. Um, so after Pont Nowith, um, this, this sort of early Neanderthals, uh, they were sort of doing their thing around 270, 250. Then um, the climate starts to cool. Um, and for a very long time, certainly between 200,000 years all the way through till about 60,000, we don't have any evidence for Neanderthals at all or anybody else in Britain during that period. And there's many reasons for that sort of absence that, that have been proposed, but in terms of it being tested over the over the decades, it does seem to be a genuine sort of lack of people rather than we're just not finding the archaeology. Um, and I think Jamie's going to be able to sort of discuss the, the potential uh, reasons behind that. But in terms of where Cresswell fits in, um, we know that uh, some animals were here at Cresswell because we have evidence from these uh, sort of periods before 60,000, um, but certainly Cresswell itself is quite late in the in the wider story of the Neanderthals. Um, we believe that they are uh, present at Cresswell um, and a number of other sites in Britain. Basically, as soon as it warms up after a glacial period preceding that, they seem to come back. Um, and then they're here possibly as late as 40,000. We don't really have a great handle on that. But at Cresswell, um, they certainly are here. They're up in the Midlands. Um, and also they're in Wales again at that same period of time. So this is like the last hurrah of the Neanderthals and, and they're, they're doing good at Cresswell. <laughs> nice to hear how very important Cresswell is in their story. Um, Jamie, perhaps um, could you start to tell us about sort of the environmental context? Um, Oh, you're muted, Jamie. Sorry, just to build on uh, that really helpful introduction from Becky, would it be useful to share some slides for that, to give some context for, for sort of chronology and environments? Because this, this might be a good point to um, to do that, and then we, we can we can talk talk to those. Yeah. I'll just... Whoops, hang on. Like I want to start at the beginning. Okay. Right. Can everybody see those? Can you see those? Okay. Fine, yeah. Great, good. So just to build on what, what Becky was just saying, this um, this diagram shows the last few glacials and interglacials. So these are um, um, interglacials, these are warm periods, um, global periods of, of, of warming, and then the troughs on here are the glacial periods. So here's, these, these are given numbers, so the even numbers are cold stages of glacials, two, four, six, and eight, and the, and the odd numbers, one, five and seven, they're the interglacials, they're the warm periods. So uh, as Becky was just uh, describing, um, this is this big gap where we don't have any archeology, span we don't have any evidence of human presence uh, in Britain. After this interglacial, after what we call stage seven, uh, right up until uh, the time where we've got Neanderthals uh, at Creswell, in, in this window, let's say between about 60 and 40,000 years ago, so this middle Paleolithic, which is uh, the Neanderthal culture, we've, in, in Britain, it's, it's typically described in terms of an early middle Paleolithic, and then this long gap, and then the later middle Paleolithic. So the, the Creswell material is really very important because as Becky has explained, it's a sort of last hurrah, it's the very end of the sort of Neanderthal times anywhere really. So it's really very important. So in terms of context, um, there's, there's a lot of, I want to say there's a lot of focus on, on, the, on the peaks, like the, the, the glacials, the warm periods, which were, which were very well forested in, in Britain. And then, the, and then the glacials, when we obviously had large ice sheets, which reached to a variety of extents uh, in the UK. But, uh, but here, stage three is when we've got this last period of Neanderthal occupation is, is rather odd. There's a general period of cooling, 
But stage three is, is neither fish nor fowl. It's, it's not a full interglacial and it's not a full glacial. It's some sort of intermediate conditions. And that's, that's quite important. So we're not dealing with a, a, a big ice sheet uh, in Britain at this time. But at the same time, we're not dealing with full interglacial conditions. And this, this is also a curve of sea level. So this is high sea level. This is low sea level. So we, we'll say a little bit later about you know, where these Neanderthals came from and how they may have found their way um, into, into, uh, into Britain at that time. And I've just put a couple of images up here, which uh, Bob Nichols' wonderful images, which are from the Creswell website, of um, typically of what's an interglacial. This is, this is stage five, when we had hippos in Yorkshire, hippos around many of the rivers in the UK. And then this is a typical glacial scene, a rather uh, barren sort of uh, polar desert landscape, um, which wasn't particularly favorable for, for human occupation um, at that time. But also it's always rather sad that when we had hippos in the in the UK in stage five, there was nobody around to see them, which is um, which is a bit of a shame. But very quickly, um, this is a diagram put together by some Dutch workers in the 1960s, which I've added colour to, which shows transects across Europe in terms of a typical interglacial forested environment from the Mediterranean right up to the Arctic Ocean, and then a glacial environment with rather different ecology, rather different uh, landscapes. And I've just put these two images up here as well. But um, it's important to emphasize there's very often a very sharp focus on the extremes of quaternary climates, on the interglacials and the glacials, rather than the periods uh, in between. And, um, and as Becky describes in her wonderful book, and the Neanderthals did spend time and were able to survive in these sort of polar desert steppe tundra environments. But um, much of the Neanderthal world was focused on rather richer habitats. Um, with a greater variety of resources rather than the sort of barren icy wilderness of the steppe tundra. And at the same time, the Neanderthals were the great survivors. They also uh, occupied Britain during earlier interglacials and other parts of Europe when there, were, when there was um, extensive woodland. So the Neanderthals uh, survived in Europe and Asia during multiple sequences of, of glacial interglacial changes. Now, just to highlight the point, and um, there was a really nice paper published in 1979 by a guy called Stephen Porter, and he talked about average quaternary conditions. And I've just illustrated on this diagram here that rather than focusing on the extreme of the interglacials and the glacials, most of the quaternary ice age and most of the quaternary period was actually intermediate between these extremes. Uh, when uh, there, there were ice masses, but there were, they were tended to be in the intermediate size, sea levels were intermediate, so we didn't get extremes of glacials and extremes of high sea levels and warm climates. And this was most of the time, 90% of the time, the conditions were like this. So uh, perhaps that's, that's the sort of time period that we should be looking at. And certainly that's the sort of time period when we have Neanderthals at Creswell um, between 60 and 40,000 years ago. So that map on the right hand side was produced by um, just up the road from Creswell, Chris Clark's team at Sheffield. That's, that's a recent product of the, of the wonderful Brit Ice Chrono Project, which is probably the, we know more now about the, the last British ice sheet than any other. But the ice sheets before that are a little bit sketchier but, um, can I, can I, I just interrupt you, Jamie? Um, I don't know if the viewers are seeing the video panel, but it's covering the map for me, so they can actually make the video panel go away, because um, I'm I'm seeing like us over the over your slide, so that's an option okay. to get rid of that. Okay, thanks for that. I've just shrunk that. Hopefully, people can see that and they can move us around if they need to. So Creswell's around here somewhere. Uh, Creswell wasn't glaciated during the last. Uh, ice sheet during stage two, around about 25,000 years ago. So this environment south of here was, was, was ice free. Now, in terms of intermediate conditions, this is, this is actually later, but this is a really useful diagram. And Becky might want to comment on this. Um, this shows um, Northwest Europe, if you like, when Britain was joined to the continental Europe around about 18,000 years ago. Still, there's, there's a, a significant body of ice in here in Northwest Scotland. But uh, this is this is Doggerland, but this area would have been dry land during the cold stages and the intermediate stages throughout much of the Quaternary. And there were big rivers here coming from France, joining with the Thames, draining down through the through what's now the English Channel. So that would have been quite a difficult place to to uh, to travel across. So one of the ideas is that the Neanderthals at Creswell maybe came across in this direction here into the East Midlands. Um, Becky might want to comment on that later, but this is this is sort of typical intermediate conditions in between those extremes of glacial and those extreme interglacial conditions, which were typical across much of the Quaternary Ice Age, and um, and that would obviously have facilitated 
movement uh, from the continent to what is now the British, the British Isles. So let me just find this, this, this slide for the moment. This just shows where, broadly where Croswell is located at the present time. Um, the dashed lines show the last British ice sheet. So that was after those Neanderthals. But prior to that, uh, there was a, the most extensive glaciation in the British Isles is the Anglian here at stage 12. Though that's the, that's the glaciation that diverted the Thames down to, what's, down to London. And the, the, the ice sheet came down, almost kissed the Scilly Islands here. So that was the most extensive glaciation we've seen in the UK. This intermediate one, stage six, is rather controversial. And um, if that line is okay, Creswell was overrun with ice uh, prior to the final Neanderthal occupation. But um, it was ice free uh, for, for, for much of the last cold stage. So that's probably, um, this is another of those wonderful images from Robert Nichols, which shows that in between uh, the last interglacial and the, and the maximum of the last glaciation, this is typically what the, the paleogeography of what the, the environment would have liked, looked like at Cresswell about 50,000 years ago during stage three, um, when we do have the evidence of, of the, the last Neanderthal uh, occupation. So that's probably a good place to stop sharing those slides. Is that useful context? Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, Rebecca, have you got anything you want to add to? Um, yeah, I think um, <clears throat> in terms of sort of the, as Jamie was saying, the the nuances in, term, in understanding the Neanderthal world and the environments and the landscapes that they lived in. Um, what we see in, in Europe as a whole, rather than sort of just focusing on Britain, um, it does really look like Neanderthals were not keen on like hyper cold, arid, full on polar desert conditions. You know, they, they've they been presented for a very long time um, as, you know, sort of almost like as, as Arctic adapted as the Arctic foxes or musk oxen. And, and really when you see those species appearing in the record, it's getting a bit too cold for Neanderthals and they will sort of sort of float away. Um, but equally, um, they are okay with living in forests, um, open grassland, absolutely great. Um, but even quite warm conditions, as Jamie was saying, you have those peaks of the interglacials. We are in an interglacial right now. Um, the warmest interglacial in the Neanderthal world was um, stage five, which was about 123,000 years ago. That's actually warmer by two to four degrees than right now. Um, and the, for the kind of forest that they would have been living in, you know, there was, there was oak and, and lime, but also sort of mixes that you don't tend to see, like very large hornbeam and beech forest, things like this. So, you know, you can imagine Neanderthals that spent almost all of their time in completely forested environments with, with a few open clearings and lakes, and they're probably using those features, rivers and lakes, to actually get around that landscape. Um, but certainly the, the idea that they were full on, always adapted to, to cold conditions and that that was what they were best at, that's really not supported. Um, and certainly at Cresswell um, with, with the nuances of the landscape types, you do have, um, as the last uh, picture that Jamie showed there with, with that open sort of uh, the gorge uh, grassland and stuff. Even having said that, the plains around were probably quite open, but there is some evidence at Cresswell and other sites in Britain and Europe that during the periods when it was a bit colder than now and there wasn't sort of forests everywhere in micro environments at that is protected in terms of the climate a bit more moisture exactly like you find in gorges um, there does seem to be some survival of some tree species um, in those little tiny environments so what we might be looking at for Cresswell is you know a river running through it and maybe a few little copses of trees and, and a bit more of a, of a lush environment whereas the plains up above the gorge maybe were more open with a bit of birch on the river stuff like that so it's quite a lush environment um, that Neanderthals were in most of the time they were not sort of restricted to you know very very barren no trees at all um i think there's i think the difficulty often is that some of the the ways that we sample the paleo environmental evidence um often we get sort of signals of of uh, pollen data for example saying oh well there was no trees well quite often that's because we're getting it from open environments in in wetland areas and, and when you sample um cave sites 
um, and including uh, so like the um, the uh, speleotherm or the stalagmites and stalactites, you can actually get preserved pollen in there. Um, and they seem to suggest that there's a bit more variety going on as well. So it's quite a rich world. Excellent. Just to yeah, just, just to add to that, that, that the presence of trees is interesting. So just not stopping my eye on him in Manchester, Chelsea, for example. Um, there is Jamie, you're still Sorry, Sorry. Have, Sorry. I? have I? Yeah, a bit robotty. Okay, you <laughs> carry on. I'll, I'll pop out and come back. Okay. Um, yes, I, I was. I was going to say. Um, you've sort of led me on to my next question. Really, is about the importance of caves and. Um, you know, particularly Creswell crags and due to the many caves that we have in, in Creswell. Um, why are caves so important in preserving not just Neanderthal evidence and also other evidence? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Jamie's going to come back in on the trees. Um, do you want to, to do the trees first, Jamie? Or uh, Ang Harib was just asking about why caves are so important in terms of preserving evidence. Oh, you're muted. Um, is that better? Okay, okay, occasionally that happens, this Dalek appears and the um, best way to get rid of it is to leave the room and come back again. So, I mean, obviously a lot of the archaeological evidence we have is biased towards what's preserved in caves for that very reason, because caves are good at preserving evidence. So they're not always representative of what's happening in the, in the wider environment, but they're basically, um, they're, they're, they're depositional sinks, they're, they're environments where, where, where sediments and, and other materials are preserved in, in the long term. So, um, uh, they're often cold, they're often wet, um, and they're buried with sediments. So caves, particularly limestone caves, are ideal environments to preserve material in the long term. Whereas uh, river terraces tend to be destructive, uh, river environments will remove sediments as well as deposit them. So they're, they're a good place to actually preserve materials. Just to make the point before I turn into a Dalek, um, just just south of where I am here in Manchester near Chelford, there's the Chelford interstadial deposits where you've got really well-preserved forest deposits. Uh, you've got pine and spruce, for example, really good macrofossils, tree trunks, macrofossils and, and pine cones and leaves. So we know the trees were there in situ. And, uh, and they're, they're in, interbedded between very thick sands, which probably came from glacial meltwaters. So that was the cold stage environment. So, you know, beginning of the, of the current cold glacial. So um, the idea that Britain was tree free during the cold stages is, is, uh, is something that we should, we should move away from. In certain, certain environments, there were quite a lot of trees and that would have been quite a rich landscape. Yeah, I think also I, I will add to that actually, having sort of said earlier that, um, that there was nobody here over this huge span of time. There is one site <laughs> from the southeast uh, of England um, just before we start seeing stuff at Cresswell um, sort of when Neanderthals appear at Cresswell around 55,000 years ago, that's when it's warming up a bit. Before that, you have a very cold, really cold dip, which we call stage four. And then at the end of stage five, it's it's kind of a little bit warm, a little bit cold, a little bit warm. And there may have been very ephemeral presence of Neanderthals back in Britain at that point, basically when the sea levels have become low enough, um, they may have started to explore. There's one site with literally two flakes um, so again, this idea of, of subtlety is, is there as well for the occupation. It may turn out that uh, Neanderthals were there a little bit earlier, but at such low numbers, we can't see them. But certainly by the time uh, they're at Cresswell, the impression is quite different in terms of what they're doing. And, and that is why caves are so crucial, because as, as Jamie said, you know, they, the Neanderthals are attracted to them. Um, they're fixed points in the landscape, um, they have resources in terms of protection and, um, and microclimates inside the caves that are predictable, you know, quite strange during the winter caves feel warm during the summer they're cool, it's because they maintain their temperature a lot better. Um, so they are a real resource uh, for Neanderthals and of course other creatures like to live in caves and Harrod knows all about uh, hyenas and, and their occupation. Um, but caves also not only attract Neanderthals with all the stuff that they are doing and that they leave their artifacts, the animals, but they are also sediment traps. So certainly at Cresswell, we know that um, the way the caves fill up over time with sediment, there is stuff that comes through the mouth, but there are also what we call like chimneys and fissures that go up from the main chambers onto the plateau and material just filters down very slowly over time. Sometimes in, in other places you might get a, a rapid flood, for example, and that may have been happening 
at Cresswell, I think during some of the earlier periods, we don't know what's going on with, with the river that runs through there. You know, was there a lake during the, the earlier integration periods? Perhaps there was flooding. But during the period that Neanderthals are occupying Cresswell, we believe that the sedimentation rate, so the, the speed at which sediments come in and cover the archaeological remains is quite slow. Um, mm. And mm. what you want in a cave basically is uh, enough sediment um, that you can separate out occupation layers, uh, but it's not sort of piling in and disturbing sort of the nice spatial um, sort of configuration of what's there. Unfortunately, at Cresswell, we might have had that, but we don't know because it was excavated rather early in uh, in the history of, of archaeology um, in the in the 19th century. And they, you know, to give them their credit, they didn't know, I think, that you could, that they have no idea of what we can do with caves with 21st century archaeology and, and the fine layers that we can sort of pull out when the, when the preservation is good. Um, but, you know, even though it was dug a long time ago, um, and certainly the Victorians were not the most careful in keeping everything as we do now, um, they tended to pick out the bits that were sort of most striking to them. Um, but having said that, Cresswell is actually still a really important uh, resource for understanding what Neanderthals are doing in Britain as a whole, um, you know, and actually that they were up in the Midlands. This is this is the outermost west, basically. Yes, they were in Wales as well, but but this is quite far north in terms of the, the wider Neanderthal world. So the caves at Cresswell are really important as, a, as an archaeological resource. The wild northwest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I also, I mean, we talk about the Victorians and the way that they excavated. And obviously it, it's in terms of the whole length of time we've been interested in caves and excavating the archaeology, it's a relatively recent innovation to actually be interested in sediments. Yes. Because in the past, the sediments were thrown away. Whereas now very often we get more often valuable paleo-environmental information from the sediments themselves. And in, and in I do most of my work in the Mediterranean where we have very long lake sediment records which cover the whole of the Quaternary. But in Britain, our lake sediment records are relatively short. Most of them just only cover the Holocene and a bit of the lake glacial. So the cave records give us some of our longest records of environmental change. So um, they're really very important for a number of reasons. And also I've worked on a Neanderthal site in, in the Balkans in Savena Stiena. Uh, in Montenegro and in the 1960s and 70s that was excavated with dynamite so there are there are still recent archaeological practices that we're not uh, not too proud of so we can't just blame the Victorians for throwing everything away. No 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 it's true but I mean I think um, you know everybody thinks of Neanderthals as, as cave dwellers it's like the archetype and, and it is true yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. Um, with the history of uh, of Neanderthal research and uh, most of the the early finds were coming from caves. All of it was for Neanderthals. So, if you look at um, uh, the, the first Neanderthal fossils that we that we know of um, in the first uh, recognised find in 1856, that's from a German cave, Feldhofer. Um, then there was another one that had actually been found earlier in Gibraltar, which probably uh, was from some kind of rock shelter, possibly cave, fissure. We don't really know because it was in a quarry, um, but that was recognised uh, in 1863 and brought over to Britain. Um, and then sort of there were other finds coming up to the end of the 19th century, but they are all from caves. There were open air sort of archaeological discoveries going on in the river terraces, but the problem for the Victorians was that they had no idea how old everything was relatively, you know, within a cave, you can say the stuff at the bottom is probably older. But when you compare different caves, when you try and compare what you find in river gravels to a cave, how do you know how they relate? And for them, the only way they could do that was by comparing either the fossils, did they look the same, were the same animals there, or were the the objects the artifacts looking vaguely similar and they guessed as to what they thought was older because it just looked more crude uh, basically so they built up what we call typologies which had a chronological element to try and you know get a handle on all this stuff that they were pulling out of caves and and in river terraces and also with with the infrastructural development in the 19th century that was a big reason why suddenly the people were excavating and digging everywhere um but in terms of sort of trying to, to place um, our understanding of Neanderthals and, and how that's changed, 
Um, one of the big differences in, in terms of sort of thinking about caves is that we, we have a better handle on the fact that Neanderthals did use open air landscapes. Um, and that has been more of a sort of mid 20th century and later um, understanding as archeology span has got rather more sophisticated. And um, we do know Neanderthals lived out in the open landscape. They didn't just sort of travel through it and go cave to cave it does look as if they also actually place themselves for some periods of time in the landscape. There's a really cool uh, site from France called uh, La Folie, which is about 50,000 years old, pretty much same time as Cresswell. Um, and that was preserved by a very, very um, sort of lucky preservation of extremely fine river silts that rapidly covered this site. And um, what it appears to be in terms of the remains is basically a, a circle of what seems to actually be preserved little post holes, roughly circular, about 10 metres across, really quite large. And within that you have hearths, you have scatters of artefacts, what's probably a bedding area where there's preserved um, organic plant remains. Um, so this is basically, this is a living site in the open air. Um, we have nothing like that for Britain, but we do have a very, very nice open air site, which was only found in 2002, which is called Linford Quarry uh, down in the south uh, east in, in uh, Norfolk. Um, and this doesn't seem to be a living site. This is more of a out in the landscape, probably a, at least a butchery site, if not to do with hunting. And it appears that um, Neanderthals there were butchering reindeer and horses, probably being involved with the carcasses of at least 11 mammoths and all of this material is in a preserved river channel full of gorgeous um, beautiful hand axes absolutely huge things um, so it's a real focus of activity so when we think about Cresswell we have to understand that Neanderthals at Cresswell who were napping the kind of stone and the rock that I'm going to talk about were also active at this huge scale probably across the whole of the available area in Britain. So Cresswell is one node, basically. The caves at Cresswell are part of this wider tapestry. I think the focus on caves is entirely understandable because that's where the best preservation is. And also, as you put, caves give you a stratigraphy. They give you a sequence and an order that isn't always obvious in the, in the wider landscape. But I think a lot of archaeologists got fed up with caves and started looking at open sites. And we do have now have more spectacular open sites, I think, than, than ever before. But what's interesting is now with new developments in things like micromorphology, where we can look at really fine stratigraphy and also the recognition of tephra layers um, and volcanic ash in very fine tephra layers in, preserved in caves has kind of has reinvigorated the study of caves in many ways. And we're sort of revisiting them where we can tease out, you know, even more information and even finer chronologies now um, as techniques have improved. In terms of uh, Creswell, did the Victorians ruin, uh, ruin everything or have we sort of found uh, evidence of Neanderthals from like the 20s and 30s and 60s and 70s excavations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, may maybe Ang Harrod actually you could talk about like the history of what's happened at Cresswell a bit because I do have all my, my stone uh, pictures that I want to show people so I don't want to sort of talk forever. But yeah, maybe if you give a bit of, a, of an idea of, of the history of who was digging when and then I can, I can show off all the, the lovely objects. <laughs> I can do. I mean, people are here to listen to you, but I'm happy. Um, so, yeah, so as uh, Rebecca said, um, the first official excavations of Creswell Crags were sort of the, um, the Victorian era, and um, it was like Dawkins and Mello and Heath were the three main um, people who were very, very into excavating the caves, and I think they had to go excavating most of them. Um, and they found um, evidence of animals from the last glacial period, so hyenas and water rhinoceroses and reindeer, but also stuff from the last interglacial period, so the hippopotamuses, again with the hyenas and the cave lions. And then um, a guy called um, Armstrong came along in the 20s and 30s, and he uh, did some excavations, and he was a lot more careful, so he actually uh, collected a lot of the small mammals, which uh, tended to be ignored by the Victorians, like the bottom of the landings, which are very good at telling us stuff about the environment. Um, so if there's no other environmental information, if you find like a lemming, you can kind of gather it was pretty cold um, since they only lived sort of Norway and Russia and sort of towards the Arctic. Um, I think the 60s was Campbell, wasn't he? Um, and then the 70s was Rogan Jenkinson, and he did a lot of more careful excavations of the caves and then the 2000s was Paul Pettit uh, just outside of Churchill um, 
and that was uh, very careful excavations and revealed a lot of uh, small uh, animals again like the voles and lemons um, and then yeah I think we had some excavations last year but as far as, as far as I'm aware not much has been found yet but yeah I think that's that's a brief history of our excavations. Yeah I mean I was a bit unfair to, to Cresswell sort of saying it all the big trash trash everything they did dig in the way that they dug and it wasn't helpful Armstrong did um sort of rectify that to some degree although there was not masses left in some of the earlier sites that had been um sort of previously investigated but he did a lot of work in pinhole and I think part of the problem was um he was doing the best for his time in in some ways um but you know he had like a, a 2d recording system but um I think people, archaeologists now understand that to dig caves, caves are so complicated in how they form. Um, you know, you can have a layer like this that covers 5,000 years or a layer like this that covers 5,000 years. And you need to, to, to understand the sediments. As Jamie said, you have to look at the toponymy. So that's the formation history of that site before you start trying to assess what's going on in terms of the archaeology. And I think Armstrong, certainly in Pinhole, um, faced a bit of an issue in that you have to really dig a site like that very very slowly and then you might be able to pick out separate phases of, of occupation but I don't think even then they 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 truly understood sort of that this much sediment is going to not be one occupation most of the time um, and so although his work does mean that much later when radiocarbon technology came along and even more recently at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the um, 21st century, as people started to refine radiocarbon, um, it was possible to go back and use the material he had excavated, so the animal bones, and try and place it within the most fine sort of uh, vertical stratigraphy, you know, through time, and then try and date that. But with the artifacts, it's very difficult to work out, is this really an assemblage or not? And certainly I think most people who, and, and including myself, who've looked at the material from Cresswell would have to treat all of the material, all of the artifacts that come from this one layer as a palimpsest. So that is the material from multiple occupations, but it's it's mixed up. We, we don't have a finer resolution than that on what Neanderthals are doing. So you know, if, if those sites were being dug today, it would take decades to dig them, you know, and there are sites all over Europe that are being dug like that, um, and, and they do take decades. But, you know, having said all that, we can say um, some, some interesting things about Cresswell. So, oh, maybe should I start sharing my slides, actually? Where are we up to? Um, yep, yeah, right. Where's my PowerPoint? There it is. Okay. Okay, so I'm only going to give a very super brief idea of um, stone tool technology because it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, essentially, when um, I'm talking about cores, I'm talking about the lumps of rock that have been struck by a hammerstone, and off that comes a flake. So the flakes are the things that come off. Um, once you have a flake, you can um, use the flake straight away because it's nice and sharp. Um, and then uh, if you want to shape the edge for a particular use, you can retouch it. But actually most of the time we think Neanderthals were using the flakes in their fresh raw state um, and then resharpening them. And this is why you end up with a lot of retouch on the edges of flakes. And as you resharpen and resharpen both times, it starts to shrink. Um, so this is part of the explanation for why do you see different kinds of tools, but they, oh, my things disappeared. Um, but they do also um, uh, sort of create different kinds of um, uh, sort of notches and things. Can everybody see my little cursor, by the way? I can, yes. Oh, you can, good, because it keeps yep. disappearing. I don't know why. Um, so, yeah, and in terms of the different technologies um, that we talk about for Neanderthals, um, they certainly did 
are quite happy to use flakes, plain flakes that come off their cores. Um, but they also uh, made what we call bifaces. Some people have probably heard that uh, described as hand axes. Um, and that could be made using a whole core or quite often they used a large flake and then shaped it with shallow removals on both sides. So that's one face and this is edge view. Um, at Cresswell in particular, um, these are different ways of making flakes up here. So you have uh, Lavalwa, Kina and Discoid. Um, and uh, at Cresswell, one of the, the key technologies that we see for making flakes includes Discoid, um, which basically you strike up and down around the volume of the core and you sort of turn the core around. So it ends up sort of uh, having like a, a wheel spoke pattern sometimes, but they also used a uh, different uh, methods. And part of the reason for that is the different, um, sorry, if, is my, is this toolbar thing along the top visible to you guys? No. Or can you just see my site? Okay, that's good because it's covering it up for me. Um, so yes, uh, at Cresswell, we actually have a lot of different raw materials. Um, it's quite, it's, this is one of the ways that we can really understand what Neanderthals are up to because of the way that at Cresswell and all over their whole world, they were really, really in tune with materials. Um, so that includes uh, the animals that they used. Uh, they were very picky about the animals they hunted, the different parts of their bodies they used. Um, there's a whole world of organic uh, technologies and we know that they were really um, sort of selective in terms of wood and things like this but certainly the biggest by far amount of evidence that we have just because it preserves well is stone so lithic artifacts and we see everywhere in the Neanderthal world the same pattern that we can see at Cresswell which is that Neanderthals understood on a real real um, sophisticated level how stone fractures essentially what can you do with different types of stone um, quartzite these two up here um, is a kind of uh, stone that's that's very common at Cresswell and um, it's available locally um, in sort of cobble form. It's, it's a local geological formation. So it was all around. Um, but quartzite is really hard to nap. Um, it's, it's actually physically very, very tough rock. You have to hit it really hard. Um, and depending on the kind of quartzite, it can be relatively fine grained. Um, which means that it's likely to fracture predictably. It's not going to sort of just shatter. But having said that, it is far harder to work than flint. So it's interesting that there is a lot of quartzite here. The reason for that is that there's not a lot of flint um, up in this region. Um, certainly there, there is some, um, there are some spreads of, uh, of secondary flint so that is flint that's not from its original bedrock but across the midlands and, and across a large part of uh, britain you have um some deposits of flint that's basically been brought in by glacial action um over those those large sort of glacial cycles jamie was talking about where you can see at some times the ice sheets came super far down and sometimes that is moving cretaceous flint from the north sea across Britain but it's it's a spread and very often this secondary flint it's not very nice to nap it tends to be shattered it's been exposed to extreme cold uh, sort of on the surface and, and also through the glaciation process so it's often damaged it's not great um, at Cresswell we see two kinds of flint um, we see this stuff which is a uh, northern Cretaceous province flint which is a bit of a the term but basically it just means that flint that comes from sort of the, the midlands and upwards when we find it in bedrock context um, and then we have southern flint here which is tends to be finer quality and that's only found in bedrock in in the southeast uh, of Britain basically um, and what's interesting is we do have both of those at Cresswell and for the northern flint it may be that some of that is this secondary scatter of, of stuff there's not very sort of rich amounts in the midlands um, but it's there here you know now and then and the Neanderthals were picking it up and using it but they are also bringing this uh, southern flint from the southeast up into the midlands including to Cresswell um, so they're transporting um, different kinds of artifacts 
And uh, one of the other stones that we have at Crestwell is called clay ironstone, which is a bit of a weird rock. It's quite soft, um, but it's it's locally available. Um, it's kind of it comes from the coal measures, basically. Um, and they were still happy to use it for their needs. So there's this diversity in, in what they're doing uh, with the stone. And I'll kind of go into that a bit more. But we can see here, this is some of the ways that they are working uh, quartzite. So this up here is the same object, just this is viewed side on, this is viewed at the top, so that line there is, uh, is here. Um, and this is what's called alternate napping, basically, where you strike in and you strike in and you strike in, but you flip it as you strike. Um, so you end up kind of like with sort of going like this, it forms like a wiggly line along the edge. Um, and this is a really simple, quite effective way to get into quartzite cobbles because they tend to be sort of round. And often the, the rocks themselves don't have sort of the right angle you need to, to actually get a flake off. They can be really hard to, to open up uh, if you want to say it like that. Um, and sometimes it looks like Neanderthals are using quartzite a lot for their, for their hammers to actually do the napping and then the hammers will break and that opens the cobble up and then they can start napping that. So there's an interesting flexibility there. Um, and we can see here, they, they sort of vary between having quite simple approaches to being a bit more sort of structured in how they're working the stone. So that's kind of coming around centripetally. And then you see something similar here. So this is really, this is this wheel spoke pattern I spoke about with discoid napping. Um, and, and this is really classic uh, Neanderthal sort of approach, especially to stone that's not, not that great. Um, but you can do um, you can do more sophisticated napping on quartzite, um, but here they were not really bothering. And I think that's because um, uh, they knew that they didn't really need to, and, and it was suiting what they were interested in. The other kinds of artifacts, um, that they were making is bifaces. That's what I spoke about earlier. Um, I have a replica biface here. If you see that, this is just a flint one, uh, but you can see it's quite thin. Not all bifaces are really thin like that and it does depend on the stone. Um, and so we have, this is a clay ironstone biface up here. So even though this stone's quite soft, they're using it for tools that would have been quite sort of multi-purpose heavy duty tools sometimes. Um, this is a quartzite biface. Um, so there's, there's some quite fine um, working here and they're sort of taking flakes uh, quite far across the surface, quite shallow flake removal. Um, and then this is a really diddy little flint um, by face here. And the other kind of um, artifact that they were that they were making were um, basically retouched tools. So this is, tends to be flakes that are either being formed for a particular edge shape um, or they're just being uh, resharpened. So this is a big flint flake and um, this probably was used straight away and then that is resharpening um, this is a this is a bit of a tricky one to classify because this has been flaked quite intensively across the surface and then it has sort of slightly steeper edges here so it's more like a tool and the other side is not really worked at all so this is like a, a uni face um, and then this is northern flint. This is what we call um, a denticulate, which basically means it looks like teeth and it's got two notches here. So this kind of edge is going to give you a very different functionality to these edges. Um, I'm just thinking where I am in terms of the overall run of where we're supposed to go. Um, so what I was talking about in terms of Neanderthals understanding the stone um, and, and what they choose to do at Cresswell, we can see that um, they're very happy to use the quartzite. Um, it's around them, they can take uh, flakes off, it works for them. But at the same time, at least sometimes they are arriving with Southern Flint tools that have clearly been sourced from nowhere near Cresswell. And probably the sources for some of these is maybe 60, even 80 kilometers down in the Southeast of England. Um, and sometimes they are coming in as flakes with sort of a little bit of retouch there. This is the original sort of skin um, of what would have been quite a large nodule actually. This is just a flake that's come off a nodule. Um, but in other cases, we can see that they arrive this is the same object here, these two. They arrive really quite intensively resharpened. So you can see here, this was quite a thick flake originally. It's quite 
is quite tall when you look at my fingers there. This one is much flatter up here. Um, and this retouch, this resharpening has really sort of bitten in to the original shape of that flake. So that has probably been held on to for some time and uh, sort of resharpened through either one intensive use or carried around the landscape and resharpened a few times. And that kind of pattern, again, matches exactly what we see Neanderthals doing all over Europe. Um, they select the best quality stone for the objects that they intend to take with them when they move between different areas. Um, so everything we see them doing at Cresswell matches what we see elsewhere. So even though, you know, as I said, the, the archaeology itself, how it was excavated and everything is not ideal, you can still see a lot. Um, and this piece here is quite nice. This is a southern flint um, resharpening flake from a biface. And this comes from, um, I think this one's from Pinhole. Um, and at Pinhole, we have no bifaces that match this. Um, and this is actually the case for multiple different materials in stone at Pinhole. What we're actually seeing with these pieces is Neanderthals coming from different places, using a uh, rock, they bring bifaces with them, use them, resharpen them, these flakes come off and are left, and then they take that biface away somewhere else. So these pieces are like the witnesses to this presence of objects that are no longer there, they've been moved elsewhere. And this piece is especially nice because you can see around the edge here, although it's very small, it's only three centimetres um, across, this has actually itself then been lightly resharpened to turn it into a tool. So we're looking at economies. They understand the scarcity of this kind of stone in this region and they make allowances for that. And you don't see that with the local nicely available quartzite because it's just not worth it. Um, <clears throat> I might pause there. I don't know, were we gonna talk about, um, oh no, we went, it was still me. I've got a little run sheet here that Ang Harrod uh, created. Um, <clears throat> Can I just um, yes. ask you onto this? Um, once they've created all of these tools, what would they be used for? What would, what were they doing with these tools? Um, it looks like pretty much um, in terms of what we can see direct evidence for, um, there's plenty of animals in the caves um, that uh, would make sense as Neanderthal prey. There's not a lot of animal bones with actual cut marks on them. Um, it's very variable between Neanderthal sites as to how much you get, and it does depend on the material that's been kept and things. But at Cresswell, I think um, there's evidence for woolly rhinoceros and um, butchery, um, certainly uh, reindeer, um, and probably other animals as well. Although at uh, Cresswell, we know that there are hyenas using these sites, and this is one of the problems with how they're excavated. It's it's difficult to sort of disentangle exactly which fauna the, the Neanderthals were responsible for versus what the hyenas were bringing in as prey. And they were obviously not using the caves at the same time. Mm. Um, but certainly I think we would potentially expect that Neanderthals were aware of the caves as a resource for themselves to come to, but the reason why they were coming to the Midlands um, from the southeast of Britain or across Doggerland um, from Belgium, they could have been operating on that kind of scale. We know that they're moving stone hundreds of kilometers in some uh, regions. So that's that's possible that, that French Neanderthals are coming over and, and this is their world as well. Um, but it's uh, one of the species that it looks like there may have been an especial attraction for, could be the reindeer. Um, there are some regional sites where uh, there's sort of newborn calf uh, reindeer bones. There's no evidence of Neanderthals in those sites, but if reindeer are using the, the British Midlands sort of as a summer calving region, then that certainly would have been something that would be attracting them. So it's probably to do with that. Um, <clears throat> And uh, if I if I sort of come to, to this slide and, you know, how do we understand Cresswell in its broader context? Um, very close to Cresswell, only a couple of kilometres away, there's another like a mini gorge, uh, Burnhill Grips. And this is where Ash Tree Cave um, is, which is a really interesting site. This was um, also dug in, in the early 20th century. Um, there's not a lot of archaeology from there. Um, but what there is is quite informative and it certainly does seem that it sort of fills in part of the picture that's missing at Cresswell. Um, so Neanderthals are using the similar sort of stones, they're using um, 
quartzite, uh, that's that. This is a clay ironstone. This is a uh, southern flint. But we can see here it's it's much more ephemerally occupied than than the than the Cresswell crags. Um, so this this is one of these little witness pieces that I spoke about before. This is another biface, uh, probably resharpening flake. This one. Um, there's no biface there in this material at ash tree. And the similar thing here, this is another resharpening flake um, that potentially has had little notches taken out there. Um, so the similar pattern of, of them being aware of different raw materials um, and of, of this sort of um, fragmentation of what they're doing in different parts of the landscape. Ash tree cave was probably well known to the Neanderthals that used Cresswell. We don't know if it, you know they were used at exactly the same time or if there's any direct relationship between these artifacts and the ones at Cresswell but certainly they would have been aware of that landscape and if we go I, for oh sorry oh, yes, oh sorry on. so you, I mean can I ask a question Becky I mean yeah. it's um if if the good quality flint is such a rich resource and it's so scarce at Cresswell um I mean an interesting question is you know why do we find any flint at all because you wouldn't you wouldn't want to discard anything you'd keep hold of the best stuff wouldn't you well, these are really tiny. That little piece there on the right is just a tiny little um, resharpening flake. So that's just um, material that's from, a, from from reworking, resharpening of a tool. Exactly, one of those yeah. tools. And some of those, um, that, that tool that was quite heavily resharpened, when you sort of resharpen scrapers um, beyond a certain point, the angle starts to become unworkable. So you kind of end up having to discard it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what we don't see is any, you know, massive flint hand axes yeah. which is what you see at Linford that site I was talking about that open air site in Norfolk which is at that region Norfolk is awash with gorgeous massive flint so they don't care about leaving them down there but they were different, different it's a different economy there yeah they understand the geology of like the whole of, of Britain basically um, you can see that they make different decisions according to the geology in the region so they are knowledgeable um, <clears throat> And it is interesting that the, the most north westerly site that we know of um, that is very probably Neanderthals um, is up in Derbyshire. This is Ravencliff Cave um, that uh, literally there's one object from it. Um, it's this and this is a flint scraper and it's another one that has been transported. You can see it's been quite heavily resharpened around the edge and presumably left there. Um, the cave is up here in the cliffs and similar sort of animals that are in the other sites, you know, that's how we know it's a it's a site that's that's ice age context. And this object, although it's only one, it does match in terms of the technology, what Neanderthals are up to. So that very probably is Neanderthals and that's the most Northern reach that we see them. But it's quite plausible that the Neanderthals who knew Cresswell also knew these other big limestone gorges further north in Derbyshire. Um, and we know, um, certainly, although we don't have any Neanderthal archaeology in Scotland, the environment is there. Um, we know there's woolly rhinos and things like that up there. So, you know, we should really be seeing Cresswell as part of this much wider landscape. Um, and this is just to sort of finish off um, to give this idea of the context of Cresswell and how it all fits in. Um, down here, you can see this is one of the clay, these are the clay ironstone pieces from Cresswell. That's the biface there. That's another little one. Uh, this is one of the quartzite pieces. Um, and this I think is also, uh, that might be the one from Robin Hood cave. Um, but this, the rest of this is all the other different kinds of bifaces from Britain. Um, so up here, these are most of these come from Linford. These are the huge, big flint ones. Um, you can see sort of compared to these, they're vast. Um, and that's to do with the availability of raw material. But what you can also see there is, you know, something of a shared um, understanding of what a biface should look like. Um, and, and the sort of the looks of it really is about how you're making it. Um, and what we can see although it doesn't come through so well in, in the materials that we have at Cresswell most of the time, um, is that um, Neanderthals had particular ways of, of forming their biface. Uh, quite often they would work one entire face, then turn it over and do the other side. Um, and that's shared across different sites. But you can see that when you look at sort of Cresswell as one site, it's very important because we have multiple caves, how those caves are used also seems to be different. I haven't really touched on that, um, but it fits into this picture of, of, of a Neanderthal sort of Britain um, that certainly was also 
connected to the rest of the continent. But they're, they're, they're not coming to Creswell for the stones. They're, they've made decisions to come for the game and to make the I best use so. of the stones. Yeah, yeah, and we know as well that they're also, um, during this period, going over to uh, Wales. Um, there was the early Neanderthals in Wales I talked about earlier uh, before. Um, but at this same time, sort of post 60,000 years ago, they are in Wales um, again um, at Coigan Cave. And they're making these. These mm. are from Coigan. Um, this is on volcanic rock. Uh, what's interesting at Coigan is that we have no imported flint objects at all. And again, this is another site that was dug rather early. The, you know, what was kept, we're not quite sure what the excavators might have chucked away. But I, if there were lovely big flint scrapers there, I'm sure we, they would have kept them. So there is a difference here in terms of what they're doing that far west in Wales. So, you know, perhaps that's related to your flint just runs out. Your scraper is just too used up by the time you get to Wales. I don't know, but. Um, but there's 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 always intentionality in what they're doing, and that that involves how they are using Cresswell within the wider landscape, and and why they're moving between these different areas. So I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, Thank you. There we go. I think we had another topic to discuss, but um, we've actually got quite a few questions. So I think if we go to the questions um, now, um, that's okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, the first one is from Norman, um, and he said um, that you mentioned the Neanderthal presence in Northwark, um, and is referred to the later Neolithic exploitation of flint from grinding graves. And he wonders if there's any evidence of Neanderthal use of Norfolk flints from Grimes grave actually in Creswell. Um, no, because Grimes Graves is all like those are excavated mines and um, we have no evidence of Neanderthals like actually mining. Um, at, at Linford, with all those lovely big hand axes in Norfolk, we assume that they are getting that flint from rivers that are cutting through bedrock that basically has that material or um, large lumps of, of the Brandon flint, the really nice flint um, that has been sort of naturally eroded out. But we have no evidence of Neanderthals doing any like large scale mining because I mean, if anyone's been to Grimes Grave, I'm very lucky I've been in there. It's absolutely mind blowing. They're huge deep pits. We see nothing like that for Neanderthals. Thank you. Um, and Tim wants to know, um... Is there anything unique about Neanderthal life at Criswell? Um, I think in terms of, well, I mean, if you look at Britain, then yes, it's a completely unique place because you have these, these different raw materials and it's one of the best places to understand what we call non-flint sort of technology and use. So it's very important for that reason. Um, but I think, I think what, Cresswell stands out as sort of as, as, as important as well, because it is so far in the broader Neanderthal world, you know, if you look at the Europe and Eurasia, it is right at the westernmost edge of their range, really. Um, and so I think understand the fact that they seem to be basically doing the same thing in all places shows that they were really adaptable and they were able to sort of you know, just do what needed to be done in, in whichever environment they were in, even when it was quite far um, to the West and um, probably, you know, less um, sort of certainly less balmy than the Mediterranean, which was being occupied at the same time. And the animals uh, also were different, but really it's, it's very similar to what we see elsewhere in terms of the sophistication of what they're doing. Um, let's go to this one. Is there any evidence for plant use? At Cresswell. Um, Anywhere? Anywhere, yeah, there's abundant evidence for plant use um, overall for Neanderthals. Um, I think compared to the amount of stone we have, not so abundant, but um, we've got a much more um, evidence for that. And I talk about that a lot in the book because it's it mostly it's quite recent finds. So we have spears from multiple different places. Oh, some have we lost the Zoom? Uh, no, I think Jamie starts sharing. Oh, oh, is he off to find? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. I've, I've frozen at this end. Can you still hear me? I can, yeah. Okay, well, I can hear myself and you too. Um, maybe, can you ask the audience if they can hear us? Because I can't see anything. Jamie, do you want me to stop you screen sharing? 
Yeah, please do. I don't know how that happened. It wasn't <laughs> deliberate, but I, I've, I seem to have frozen at this end, but it's good you can still hear me. Okay, somebody says they can still hear. It's um, fine from the audience point of view. It's just Jamie screen sharing. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, so yes, we have we have a lot of evidence that they knew about plants to eat, um, that they had just as much of, of a sophisticated understanding of materials in terms of wood um, for, for making spears, digging sticks as well, which don't sound very exciting, but actually they treated them with as much care as they did the spears. At Cresswell, no, we don't have any evidence for plants, um, direct evidence. Um, we might assume that some of the uh, denticulated tools I was showing you with those little notched edges, they potentially were for wood use because in, um, in other sites we can essentially we can do what's called use wear, where you look um, at the edges of an object and what it's been used for leaves a very distinctive uh, micro polish basically and you can assess that. It's very difficult to do on court site unfortunately, um, but certainly uh, discoid, uh, sorry not discoid, um, denticulated tools with these notched edges quite often they are being used for wood but not exclusively so sort of I would imagine they probably were um they I can't quite remember if there's any burning evidence I think there's charcoal but I don't know if there's any burnt bone at Cresswell I think there might be actually um maybe I Harry can remember what you have in your collection there but I think there may be a little bit of burnt bone um, so that, you know, if you assume that you're going to need some wood for that, then certainly there is, um, there's potential, but there's nothing direct. No, if there's any burnt bone in our collection, there's not a lot. But no, it's, it's minimal. I think it's from Rogan Jenkinson's stuff, actually. He found a few sort of very small burnt things in the sections that he did. Um, okay, so probably last couple of questions. Um, Edward has asked why do you think there is such a long absence of neonatals from Britain during M MAS5? Um, well I think yeah Jamie would probably um, say say the sim same thing to me to answer this and he can um, come in as well essentially it's to do with we believe that it's to do with a very rapid rise in sea levels um, at the end of um, the stage six glaciation so um, that's sort of around I guess 150,000 between 150 and 130 and um, that whole period uh, when you have the early Neanderthals and they leave certainly by around 200 then it's very cold um, and the sea levels would have been low but it looks like it's too cold and nobody's really here and then the end of that glaciation it looks as if it got warm really fast um, from about 130,000 years and it may be that sea levels just rose really quick um, and it made it difficult for groups that were recolonizing back up into the northwest to, to get over to Britain in time and um, Jamie will probably um, sort of correct me I, I have written in the book I, I might have <laughs> um, sort of gone too far in terms of my interpretation but I, I understand that there is also evidence that there was a huge flood um, from a, a lake that had been penned in a sort of by glacial um, sort of action. There was a large lake that covered a lot of the North Sea and that broke through and it may well have scoured out that huge area of land between France and Britain and made it, you know, really not a very nice prospect to try and live in as you're, as you're moving across. So there may have been something, you know, dramatic like this that had a big impact at the same time as the sea levels being um, sort of just very rapid. So maybe Jamie wants to um, discuss about that as well. Yeah, but also, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, the, um, obviously, as Rebecca mentioned earlier, that stage five, that what, what we, in Britain we call the Ipswichian integration or the Eamon integration was, was warmer. So sea levels are actually higher during stage five than, than they are today. Yeah. Uh, probably by maybe two or three meters or more, probably because of melting of the Greenland ice sheet. So um, the sea levels were higher. So, um, and if the sea level rose very, very quickly, it would have, it, it was, it, you know, we haven't got any evidence of Neanderthal occupation, any human occupation in, in, in Britain during stage five. So Britain was obviously very much an island then. It was an early Brexit. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, the, you know, it, so, and whether there was a, any, any sort of catastrophic drainage down, down through the, the channel at the time, which, which, um, you know, was it was it was another deterrent or another reason for that? Um, is is you know is is up is up for debate. But um, I think simply that Britain was an island and sea level was higher, and and then any Neanderthal populations were elsewhere. 
Yeah, and there's something else that's really interesting is, as far as I know, all those animals got over, you know, we certainly have hippo and we've got lion, deer. There's a lot of things over here, but there's not horse. Um, so is there something going on that only particular animal species are getting here? Um, is the environment just not right for horses? But Neanderthals basically, you know, although they are woodland um, adapted in the in the Mediterranean, they hunt red deer and things like this in forest. Um, during this period, um, certainly up in the Northwest, they would have been focused on open plains animals, so like horses and bison. And we don't see horses during that period either, which is quite odd. Um, you would expect them to be there as part of, you know, they're in France, um, but they're, they're just not in Britain. So something may be going on in terms of um, when the horses came back, um, maybe the Neanderthals came back at a similar time and it was already too late. Um, but and, and maybe the hippos are getting over because perhaps it was it was soggy and, and it was already sort of the sea level was rising and marshy. We don't know. it. I mean, it's a fascinating question. Thank yes, you. it is. I think we're pretty much out of time now. Um, so, um, I mean, we do have a few more questions, but we don't really have time. So thank you uh, for everyone for your um, interest in the talk. Um, I mean, if my colleague Rebecca pops the links to the books again in the chat, um, in the chat box. Um, some of your questions might be answered in Jamie and Rebecca's books. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you want to pop <laughs> Good, your, good. Um, I like that. Very nice. <laughs> Do you want to pop your Twitter handles in the, in the chat box as well? Or? So I know you're quite, you've been very active on Twitter, so. said tutor <laughs> tutor <laughs> so um yeah thank you so much uh, rebecca and jamie for coming uh, to do this talk um i found it fascinating um i think jamie's disappeared but i found it fascinating um and I, I, from the questions, I, I think the audience did as well. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for, for everyone attending. Great.